Hi, I'm Sister Edith Bogue, and I'm glad to welcome you to Psychology 2335 Statistics for Professional Practice. I will be with you over the next eight weeks in these videos, usually as a disembodied voice, but every so often I will put in an appearance so you have a face to go with the sounds that you hear. I encourage you to use the question forums whenever something comes up that you don't understand, and don't work too hard or too long on any one problem. If you find that you're still stuck after 10 or 15 minutes, it's usually worthwhile to go on to another problem, ask a question, and wait until you get some more information to help yourself get over that hump and onto a better understanding. I encourage you also to leave yourself plenty of time in this course. Statistics is something that takes a while to percolate into the brain. So start early each week, work hard, and um, you'll be like the hundreds of students I've had over the years. Almost all of them have succeeded, and everyone who has tried hard and done all the work has always managed to pass the course and do well. I'm sure you can do the same, so let's dig in. One good way to think about learning statistics is to think about it as a second language. It's going to have verbs and nouns and a lot of special terms and even some new symbols that will be part of the language. When you think about it as a language, the best way to learn a language is to say the new words out loud to really think about their meaning, almost like vocabulary flashcards. When you look at an equation, and think of it as a language, you can change the equation into a sentence that might be a recipe or a sequence of commands. I also encourage you to think about research that you read about in your other classes in terms of the language of statistics, with statistics. One of the first sets of terms we use refer to the people or the subjects that we study. If we could study everybody, or every instance of a particular thing, we would call it the population, and the numbers that we calculate would be parameters. But usually we can only study some of the people, and therefore the numbers that we calculate are called statistics. Notice that it's easy to use that initial letter to keep those two things straight. Sample statistic, population, parameter. We measure various things about the sample, and those traits or characteristics are called variables. The reason it's a variable is that it has the possibility of more than one value. It might be something like height or weight, or the brand of car that you drive, or your favorite flavor of ice cream, or your t-shirt size. We use the term values to refer to the possible outcomes of a particular variable. So for t-shirt size, small, medium, and large would be values, and the variable would be t-shirt size. That language will become more familiar as we go along. There are several ways to categorize variables. One of them is to consider discrete versus continuous variables. Discrete means that it comes in units of a particular size and that it doesn't make sense to talk about half of a unit or a fourth of a unit. So something that's countable, like how many people in the group, is a discrete variable. In contrast, a continuous variable is usually me measured along a continuum, so we may say that it's 5 degrees outside or 10 degrees outside, but in fact, it might be 10.5 or 10.2, and we've just rounded our number. When we're dealing with continuous variables, we've assigned a value or a number to a particular location on the continuum, but in actuality, that number refers to a range of values, and we call the limits the real limits. So looking at this thermometer that is registering slightly above 24 degrees, we would call it 24, but in fact 24 as a value refers to anything from 23.5 to 24.5, and we will need to use those real limits in some of our other calculations. 
Another way to categorize variables is by their scale or level of measurement. It's important to be able to recognize the scale or level of measurement rapidly because it determines which statistics are legitimate to calculate. The four levels are nominal, which comes from the word for name, and it's a level in which all you can do is name the values. So something like make of car or hair color is a nominal variable. An ordinal variable means that we can name the categories, and in addition, we could put them in order. Something like t-shirt sizes, small, medium, large, extra large, has an order, but we don't know if the difference between each size is the same amount. So all we can do is put them in order. That's an ordinal variable. An interval variable adds one more piece of information. We know that the distance from one category to the next is the same. One of the most usual or common interval variables is temperature. We know that the difference from 10 degrees to 20 degrees is exactly the same amount of heat as the difference between 80 degrees and 90 degrees, although in the summer it sure doesn't feel like it. A ratio variable adds one more piece of information. There is an absolute zero, that when you say zero, it means the absence of that uh, trait or characteristic. So with temperature, zero does not mean that there is no heat whatsoever. It's just a point on a scale. But if we were talking about something like dollars in your pocket, zero would mean that truly there were no dollars in your pocket. Ratio refers to the fact that if there is a zero, now we can use the language of ratios. We can say that something is half as much money as something else where we cannot say that there's half as much heat on a winter day as on a summer day. Continuous variables that we talked about earlier are almost always interval or ratio because they go from low to high, usually in equal steps along a continuum. Discrete variables are a little trickier. They can be found at all levels. Nominal variables are always discrete, and ordinal variables are usually discrete, but interval or ratio variables can be discrete or continuous. So for instance, if I have the variable how many students are in the class, that's going to be discrete. Students come as whole units, one student, two student, three students. But on the other hand, if I asked how much time did people spend studying for the class, it would be a continuous variable. Um, both of those could be a ratio level variable. Zero would be the smallest, and they go up from there. Let's look at the review of math notation and a few principles that our textbook gave us. One of the things that's important is summation notation, and that summation sign, which is a capital sigma, sort of like an S from the Greek alphabet, shows up everywhere in statistics. You need to think of it as a verb, and it's um, actually a command. It's telling you to sum up or add together whatever it is that follows. Summation has its own place in the standard order of operations that the textbook also referred to. A couple of things to remember from algebra in high school is that uh, when we multiply two negative numbers, we end up with a positive product. And that will come up in some of our computations this week and the next. In this particular textbook, we're encouraged to round numbers to three decimal places. And it's uh, important if you're working with a calculator to carry as many decimal places as possible as you work towards a solution. Every time you round, we lose a little bit of information and the final result can be off. When we round um, 0 through 4, round down, and 5 through 9, round up, so we would round from the fourth digit up. And summation, as we said, that summation sign tells us to add all the values of whatever score comes after it. 
The order of operations is a big sounding phrase, but it really means when you look at an equation, what thing do you do first? Within any of the particular operations, we move from left to right, but we do the operations in a particular order. If an equation has anything in parentheses in it, we do whatever is inside the parentheses first so that we have that result for the rest of the equation. The second thing that we do is to compute anything with exponents, um, either a square root or being squared. So it can show up as square root symbols or as exponents above a number. They tell us to multiply that number by itself a certain number of times or to take its root. After we've done the exponents, then we would do any multiplication or division, and finally, any addition or subtraction. The summation comes in as part of the addition or subtraction. So if we have that summation sign, we would do it last in the order of operations, unless it's part of something in parentheses. In addition to the review that's in your textbook, Khan Academy puts out a wide variety of videos that walks through solving quite a few problems. And there is a site online called Purple Math that gives lessons and plenty of chances to practice. It gives you a problem and then helps step you through the solution. I'm putting uh, links to both Khan Academy and Purple Math into the left-hand navigation so that if you want that kind of more extensive refreshing, you can uh, find a way to get it. I encourage you to dive right in. Um, we are ready for both Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 in our textbook that deal with the subjects in these videos, and then you'll be ready to take the short quiz that goes with the math review. You've got multiple attempts. The goal is to um, keep taking the quiz until you know that you know the math well enough. Good luck.